how do I get that foot in the door? Because you have the the vicious circle of want to hire someone with experience, but they got to get that foot in there to start. A lot of people say, I have imposter syndrome. Usually is because there is some lack of security. What's the right way to approach studying if you're juggling a day job? Approaching certification should never be about passing the exam. And that's a very controversial statement. Hey folks, Rue Campbell here for Threatscape. Today, I'm going to be talking to maybe the most productive man in the Microsoft security world. You'll cover that. Yuri Dojnes, he's the principal PM manager for Defender for Cloud. We're going to chat about all things Defender, CNAP, and building a cybersecurity career. Yuri, great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm glad that I'm, I'm part of this new initiative that you you and your team is putting together. So thank you very much for inviting me. Yep. No, it's it's funny when we were when we were kind of brainstorming names and things from the Microsoft security world to pull in. Naturally, your name popped to the top of the list because, like I said in the, the intro, you are the most productive man, maybe. <laughs> you know, you get a little bit of competition. Maybe Oren is a few more books than you. I don't know. It's, it's probably close at this stage. But anyway, just... You know, 18 plus years at Microsoft, principal PM manager for Defender for Cloud. Do you maybe want to give folks a little introduction to yourself and what you do at Microsoft? Absolutely. Yeah, I've been at Microsoft for 18 plus years, started uh, in in CSS, customer support, really moved to security roles in, in 2007 with Pfizer Server. It was a great ride with Pfizer Server for Front TMG, for Front UAG, super fun time. And then moved to Windows Security, writing uh, content for TechNet at that time. And then in 2015 came a project called Roland. It was an Azure Secure Dashboard. So I was part of the initial project, which became Azure Secure Center. In we released public preview Thanksgiving 2015. And I've been working with the product ever since. I moved to a PM role in 2017 in the same team. And, and then we, we changed the name of the product. But people don't realize how old the Center for Cloud is, right? Because it's, this is going to be nine years old. It's a very mature product. But again, it, is, it started with a Secure Center. And, and in 2022, I think, I, I became full-time manager. So I manage a team of PMs. I have PMs in the US, PMs in, in Europe for the Fed for Cloud. We, we basically help our customers to onboard at the Fed for Cloud. And we also work as a bridge between the customer's feedback and insights and the engineering to help build new capabilities and roadmap and things like that. So we, we act as this customer voice embed into the engineering and, and i get and that's my microsoft work right there is a lot of all the things that i do aside from microsoft yep yep well just so that folks are aware you're just joining us at 6 30 a.m local time so you know we really appreciate that and and i'll tell you what maybe before we get into exploring some of the defender for cloud stuff maybe we could talk about some of that the, the stuff outside of you know the, the day job and um, i can see it right over your shoulder there your new book building a career in cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, I'd love to kind of touch on that insofar as you hear a lot of things about, you know, the massive demand for cybersecurity employees. Um, and then I, I know from basic personal experience, some of my family are studying for cybersecurity and things like that, but there's still a little bit of a question mark of, well, how do I get that foot in the door? Because you have the, the vicious circle of want to hire someone with experience, but they got to get that foot in there to start right so yeah. why did you why, why did you write the book and what some of the, the, the key takeaways that readers can expect so i since i've been teaching at a university for the past nine years at ec constant university on their bachelor in cyber secure program i keep hearing questions from the students about starting the career and and always the same pattern of questions, not only from my students, but also from people online, from people that I mentor at Microsoft. So I was like, I need to put all these things on paper because what people are missing is a roadmap. It's basically how to get there and understand that cybersecurity is a really, really broad term. It became this huge domain. And there's a lot of ramifications that you can go through. 
and what I also seen is people that go to one area of cybersecurity, they get frustrated because it's not really what they thought would be because everyone thinks that it's about hacking stuff and not that everything is about that. There are different areas within cybersecurity. So I started, the first thing that I do in the book is really to, to lay down the opportunities within cybersecurity field and how to take advantage of the knowledge that you already have. Because the most common thing that I see is people in the IT infrastructure or IT networking that they want to go to cyber. So it is not really a reset. You, you have to be smart to leverage your strengths and understand that you already have some knowledge that can be applicable. So in the book, I go through a self-assessment process to understand your strengths and understand your weaknesses. And then let's go look for positions that are open. And I use heavily LinkedIn in the book to search for position because I want people to read the job description and the responsibilities of the, the role. Because that's where you're going to see, okay, is this something that I want to do for a living? Do I have some of the skills that uh, really fit my profile? Uh, let's look at not only the technical skills, but also the soft skills, which is something that a lot of people, they lack. They think that they just need to be good technically. And the reality is it's not that way. I've been hiring people in the institute since I became a manager. And even before that, I was part of many hiring process, interviewing people. And, and sometimes depends, of course, depends on the job and then the the level of seniority of the job, you may be hiring someone more because of their soft skills, abilities, rather than technical capabilities. And the reason for that is because it's way cheaper and easier to train someone technically than trying to change one's behavior towards challenge, short collaboration, you know, growth mindset, all those things that sometimes people take for granted or they have bad behaviors or bad habits that will be much harder for me to train them on that, right? So I've been receiving so much amazing feedback on the book because it opened up the minds of people. Yet, even yesterday, I, I received a message on LinkedIn of someone that says, I have 16 years of experience uh, in the cybersecurity field, but just by reading the TLC of the book, I was very compelled to read it and take some of the, the tips out of there. Because it's not only about the technical abilities. In the world that we live, we have information available for others everywhere. So I can learn technical, technical things, but what is the path? What are the options? How to frame your mindset to pursue that? How to overcome the challenge of not having the experience? What are some of the things that I can do to gain experience and, and start to build this parallel job because the other thing is a lot of people they are already in a good position in the IT infrastructure. Let's say I'm a CEO cloud administrator. First of all, you're probably not gonna migrate from a CEO position in the infrastructure IT infrastructure directly to a CEO position in cyber because you know nothing about cyber. So are you willing to take a hit and start from scratch? Can you afford this at this time of your life to have a hit on your salary? You know, so there's a lot of questions that you have to think about. I love that point that you kind of raised as far as it's it's easier to teach technical skills than it is to teach personality, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, someone who's maybe, you know, maybe you're 30, 40 years old, and that's 30 or 40 years of the accumulation of either good habits or bad habits, right? And one thing that's speaking from personal experience, um, I'm always amazed at how, how kind of, if, if you put in the work, and you get your head down and you use the right resources, how, I don't want to say easy, but how simple it is to really level up your technical skills, right? And I feel like in this world we're in now, where, you know, you take something like Defender for Cloud, and you grab $150 of free credits, and you can just run with it, and you can do it all from home, yeah. right? So the, the, the cost of upskilling in cybersecurity, to me, is less than potentially the cost of upskilling as... Let's say you want to be a lawyer and you got to pay a whole bunch of university tuition and all the rest of it, right? And even if, and you, go, I'm, even if you compare, because you're old enough, you're going you're gonna to remember that. If you, even if you compare 15 years ago, before the cloud, do you, do you remember how much time and how much money it took us to build a lab? That you have yes. to have physically a bunch of computers to start doing tests. And now, now, and now you can 
get the 30 days free trial in Azure and do a bunch of things with that 30 days trial without spending a dime. So yeah. cloud also enable us to rapidly ramp up on things in, and also way cheaper than it was in the past. Definitely. I remember back when, you know, I'd be trying to study and I'd be labbing and trying to build servers and things like this. And I would have like, this was really before I started using Hyper-V and I would have like virtual box and I'd be trying to scrape like 512 megs to run a server here and an extra 256 megs here. You know, it's like the, the kind of just the evolution of your personal consumer hardware being more powerful has really made it easier for you to to test this stuff out, yeah. right? Um, and I'll tell you what, one other kind of little, it's not a hack, but love the tip you mentioned, scour LinkedIn, right? Because I remember one thing I used to do um, at the right at the beginning of my career was, you know, I'd watch like someone, I'd watch like video training that someone would be doing on Microsoft TechNet or Pluralsight or Train Signal back in the day. And I'd find them on LinkedIn and I'd say, okay, well, what was your career path? You're maybe where I want to be now. Let me go back to the beginning and say, okay, well, actually, realistically, this would be my starting point. And LinkedIn is also such a great tool for broadcasting yourself to the world, right? Yeah. So if we take that example of someone that's uh, maybe just a cloud security engineer, not specifically cybersecurity. Well, if I start blogging, YouTubing, all that yeah. kind of good stuff, yeah. I can raise awareness of who I am, right? Yeah. If you think about the way that how hard it was to get into cyber in the past because it was that very niche group of people that you have to physically go to places and meet. It was a very close community. Nowadays, not only is a more open community, but nowadays you have more opportunities to contribute. You have more opportunities to be a volunteer in, in conference. And COVID has changed a lot of dynamics. We now have way more opportunities to do things online and that, that are well accepted. And this shift came exactly during COVID because even before COVID, although what the online world was active, it was not as active as it became after COVID just because it became normal to be to do online stuff, online conference and not everything, right? So it opened up a whole new opportunity. As a matter of fact, my show, Defender for Quality of the Field, was born exactly during COVID because of, of that reason, because we were doing everything online. Right. Awesome. That's great. And through your kind of, I can't, I can't list all the certifications you've got. You know, you talk about building a career in cybersecurity. You, you got, you're one of the most qualified people that we're probably going to have on this, this show. That's the starting point for a lot of folks, right? Um, to plug some of your books, for example, you know, we've got the AZ 500 study guide, et cetera, et cetera. If folks are wanting to build that career and they're thinking, well, you know what, I got to prove myself the blogs and the LinkedIn, that's all one thing, but I want to get certified. What's the what's the right way to approach studying if you're juggling a day job? Because well, I'm talking to someone at the minute who obviously you're studying a PhD, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. while juggling a full-time job. So how, how what, what's some kind of tips that folks can use day-to-day to... -day to yeah, I love, I love this question because approaching certification should never be about passing the exam. And that's a very controversial statement, right? Because people focus on passing the exam. The focus should be using the certification to learn about the content. Passing the exam will be a consequence because a lot of people, they just want to memorize what is necessary to pass the exam so that they have the, the badge to proudly show on LinkedIn and things like that. The question is, did you really learn throughout this journey? Because if you are doing a certification, you should use that moment to say, okay, this is a great opportunity for me to go through this entire table of contents for this certification and learn about all those things. I'm going to really learn. This is a roadmap. This is a learning roadmap. That's how you should see a certification. And after you finish learning all that and you take the exam, you should be able to pass because you learn. So the, the, the certificate itself is a consequence. And, and if you start thinking that way, it makes it much easier. It, it creates less pressure on you because you're not focused on, on the day of the exam, which is also a lot of people freak out because that's the word exam. But it should be a consequence. And you're going to feel more prepared also. People will say, how do I manage the time? Time is important. You you got to be organized and you, and you, try, you have to try to stop multitasking because when you... Try to multitask, it gives the false impression that you are getting a lot of things done, but the quality of the things that you are doing probably are, is not there. 
and you are never really 100% focused. So don't try to study while you are in a project, in your business hours, doing something important because you know, it's not going to really be productive. So you have to organize your time in such a way that, okay, I'm going to get my first hour in the morning and I'm going to read or I'm going to do some labs. Right? Or organize your time so that when you are doing something, you are dedicated to do something. We live in a in a world that demands us to be multitask, and we need to resist that because we have so many gadgets, so many notifications coming up. So when you study, you gotta close your Outlook, close your LinkedIn, dial your phone, and focus on learning that thing. I think that that's an important point, which is becoming harder and harder. Me, since my first certification was in 1997. Well, I was studying the resource kit because there was not even book back in the day in Brazil about certification. So I had to get the big Windows resource kits to read that the whole thing to take the exam. But I mean, I remember studying for that. It was at least two hours deeply reading, taking notes. So we were, I was actually really learning the content. So I think that the old school approach is still the best way to do it. People say, well, but in our days reality is really hard to, to study well that's something that you cannot lack because you need to deeply learn and, and then use that at your job because if you just memorize questions it's, it's worthless it, it is worthless to you to be hired for a company that see that you have all those qualifications but then they the first task that they assign to you you have no idea what it is and you should know because you are certified yeah yeah you'll very quickly the, the kind of mirage that you build off will very quickly become apparent, right? Yeah, and, and that's where a lot of what people say, oh, I have sin- uh, imposter syndrome, usually is because there is some lack of security. If you are confident on what you do mm-hmm. because you build that confidence over time with a solid foundation, you probably will not have this problem of the, you know, imposter syndrome because you are more confident. You say, you know what, I learned that. I, I know I can do it. Yeah. It's a really good point. You you hear about imposter syndrome a lot these days, and sometimes I wonder, is it a little bit almost over self-diagnosed, right? And yeah. it's like, well, maybe if you kind of put yourself out there and just build your confidence, it's as simple as that. You know what I mean? Let's not blow it out of proportion. Um, and I'll tell you what, so so thinking then about Defender for Cloud and the work that you guys, the, the work that you guys are putting in there, you mentioned, you know, it, it's older than folks think, right? Yeah. Tracing its way all back to uh, uh, 20, yeah, 2015. So we, we have Azure Security Center, Azure Defender. I really like that name. <laughs> now we've got Defender for Cloud. And one of the things I was hoping that you could maybe help kind of help help our listeners and viewers wrap their heads around is some of the some of the acronyms and the, the terminology that's get thrown around here, right? So for example, um, CSPM and CWP, these have kind of been synonymous with Azure Defender and Defender for Cloud for a while. But increasingly, we're hearing this new term called CNAP, right? And I'm just wondering if you can explain to folks what does this mean and why does it matter? Yeah, and it's an excellent question because we started this journey of uh, cloud secure posture management improvements. And Gartner was the one that established this CSPM, this terms. These are industry terms, are not really Microsoft terms. What happened is over the years, Gartner also realized that those platforms, CSPM, Cloud Security Posture Management, Cloud Workload Protection, they were creating silos because while secure hygiene, which is is done in your CSPM solution, is important and workload protection is also important, if, if they are isolated, if they are not integrated, you are missing a lot of opportunities to improve the, the environment from the standpoint of proactive things and reactive actions as well. Uh, so the CNAP is really a combination of many of those tools in one single place that allows you to ingest information and take smart decision about things. For example, the, the most classic example is people complain to us that they are not able to ever reach the 100% on their CQ score, right? Because there's so many recommendations that they need to address to get to 100% that it feels like it's never going to happen. And I understand, understand the complaint because people say, well, I have 100 high severity recommendations. I have no idea which one should I start. Are those equal? What is really the, the, the risk 
across all those high severity recommendations? How can I take the smart decisions that are tailored to my environment? That's a super fair question. And if you do just the traditional baseline assessment, which is a static list, it doesn't take in consideration of the risk. So with a CNAP approach, we take in consideration the risk. We take in consideration risk factors that were tailored to your environment. Because now I can understand that this storage account has high severity vulnerabilities. But in reality, this storage account has no PII. It's just text and it's really not really that critical when you look at the content. But this one has PII. So they are not equal. Right, So you are starting to make correlations. That's one dimension. And then you can go to a different dimension, which is not only this storage account has PII, but if a threat actor exploits this storage, it can move laterally to this key vault. And there are secrets there. So that's where the attack path comes into play. Because now it's not only about looking at things in, in one dimension, but how... A threat actor can move across your workloads and start to do a huge damage. So that's the power of Synapse. It's taking things in consideration because I'm reading a bunch of artifacts, creating risk factor-based recommendations in attack pack. I love that point about how difficult it is to prioritize insofar as, well, you turn on any of the solutions, for Cloud being one of them, and it kind of lights up like a Christmas tree, right? gives folks a ton of work, <laughs> yeah. which is which is a good thing, right? Because you've you got to have that visibility. And I guess to your point there, when we're talking about prioritizing and attack paths, you know, sure, I might have a vulnerability on any given server, but is that server internet facing? Mm-hmm. Do we have other kind of layers of protection above that? And one of, as I'm interested in your thoughts on this, because it's a kind of thought that I've been exploring uh, our company, Threatscape. We do a lot of, uh, you know, we, we sell a lot of tools, a lot of, toys for InfoSec guys to, to play with, a lot of uh, solutions from all sorts of vendors. And to me, as this industry becomes more mature, it becomes less about grabbing tools and pushing them out and more about process. And to me, when the kind of, you know, your CSPMs and your recommendations and you're prioritizing those recommendations, that uh, that shows that sign of maturity, right? Where it's about the process. The tool is just a small part of it, right? It's then how you then operationalize something like Defender for Cloud when you're up and running with it. And I'm just wondering what's your kind of thoughts on that with regards to as we become more mature as an industry, you know, as, as are we kind of, will we eventually reach that point where folks think less about, oh, well, I just, I've turned Defender on so I'm safe. It's like, no, you now then have to implement a process to properly use Defender. Now, the process, the processes in general are very important. The tools are also important, but the, the correct usage of the tool is what really is the tricky part. It's not only about having the Fenefer Cloud enable on the subscription. It's about making sure that you are doing the right things with the insights that you receive. And that's where the process becomes so important. And we, we when it comes to maturity, it's, it's really a long journey because many companies are not there yet. And with the first statement that I make to, to really enforce that is that it's not only about looking to the recommendations and to the risks and to remediate that. It's going back to the pipeline and say, how can we prevent this from happening in the first place? What is our governance of allowing people to provision resources in the cloud? Because we should be deploying resources secure by default. And that's where a lot of people is almost like they are trying to dry ice, right? It's going to keep melting. Uh, it's never going to get dry because... You don't have process in place. You don't have governance to to avoid the deployment, the provision, and the workloads that are not secure by default. So that's a big journey. The governance team sometimes is doing one thing. The security team is out doing another thing. The developers are doing a different thing. So getting everyone on the same page is is the ultimate goal. And I've seen this issue in firsthand when we release. DevOps security as part of the Fenefer Cloud because when I, when we went to customers to talk to them about DevOps security and even API security, which is a very new field when it comes to maturity, no one is is actually there yet. They were they were they did they even know with who we inside their company they should talk with. So the cloud administrator 
new perfect to this cloud, knew what to do, but say, okay, what about the API security? Who we can talk about to see how you do API security? And like, I have no idea who when is that here in my environment. So there is, a, there is so much gap that needs to be fulfilled. Processes and self-assessments needs to be there so those teams can talk to each other. And I think that that's one of the biggest challenges, make sure that everyone is on the same page. On that point about being on the same page, minimizing the gaps and kind of increasing the scope of what you're aware of. And one of the things that some folks misinterpret about Defender for Cloud is the, the nature of it being in Azure, right? But the reality is we, we can protect workloads beyond Azure with Defender for Cloud, right? So you folks are doing a lot of work in, in third-party clouds and even extending into on-premises to some extent, right? And I wonder if you could comment on well, that. Well, on-premises is the nature of our business since Azure Secure Center. So even when we were at a Secure Center, we could always protect on-premise resource. That was part of the, the, the plan since the beginning because we were using what we call the hybrid approach. We knew that there were VMs uh, on-prem and we need to pro uh, protect those VMs. Now, the multi-cloud approach, and that's the reason why we actually changed the name of the product, because when it was Azure Secure Center, we thought it only, only protect Azure. So now we need a more agnostic name from the cloud standpoint. That's why we can defend the full cloud. And we start with AWS and GCP. And we really can do a, a lot of visibility when it comes to posture management, but we also do workload protection. And at Ignite in November last year, we released a new version of the attack that it can even do cross-cloud attack path. So imagine a scenario where a threat actor is able to get in because a resource in Azure, VM, or a solid account is exposed. And if there is a path, he can cross to the AWS account because there is a way to move laterally between clouds. So with this attack path engine, we are able to identify those scenarios, which is tremendous. People have no idea that this could be done and how to visualize this risk. So this new attack path engine, really, we invest a lot in, in this scenario because it's very important. We, and we've seen a lot of growth in this type of uh, potential exploitation scenario moving from one cloud to the other. Very, very cool. And I also understand you kind of now also across those multi-clouds, you're also expanding uh, the security standards capability, right? I think I seen on Twitter recently, you posted that you've now got things like ISO 27001, yeah. help folks kind of maintain compliance across wherever they're hosting their workloads. Yeah, yeah. We, we I mean, I know that this is going to be live probably in, in, in April, but yesterday we released 21 new standards, multi-cloud. That's, so it, it never stops the machine never stops rolling, right? You guys oh are just constantly goodness. releasing no, new features. I, I still remember <laughs> the day that I was working on Windows Server 2012 product team, and the work was you did a lot of things in one year, and then you had some time to relax and just work in on hot fix and patch, surf spec. But with clouds and the way that we are shipping things, that's why we created the release notes page, because if you go to the release notes, every month we ship things. Every month we'd have new things in front of cloud. It's wild. And you guys, you have an RSS feed for that. Is yes, that right? Because that's that, yeah. that's quite useful. Yeah, yeah. great. We'll, we'll try and link to that. And I guess, you know, just kind of, we should probably start, should probably start wrapping up here. But one of the things that on that theme of product keeps moving, keeps improving month on month, how do you guys kind of, if, if customers have feedback, have thoughts, you know, maybe competitors are doing something they're like, hey, I'd love to see that in Defender for Cloud. What's the best way for customers to kind of work with you folks to facilitate that? We have what we call the user voice. So it's a very easy link. It's got aka.ms forward slash MDC user voice. And there you can share your idea. And the idea gets voted by the community. And you know, more votes means more people are interested in that idea. Because we, we have to, there are so many things that need to be done that we should evaluate where we need to invest. Because while we respect everyone's opinion, if you have a great idea, but only you need that, probably is not going to make the cut because we each benefit the, the, the broad audience. If we have a lot of customers that are asking for the same thing, that's a good signal. That's something that will benefit the more customers and the, the investment, the return on investment is worth. Right? Because we have a roadmap, we have a lot of things that we need to accomplish. And everything is, 
is done based on customer's feedback with the customers that we work with. So the use the the user voice is a great way for you to not only speak out your thoughts but validate, see if the other customers will vote and say, "Hey, this is actually a good idea." So you, I, I think that that's a good way for you to even validate your own hypothesis. Awesome, love that. Okay, we should bring this show home. It's been really really fun talking to you. If folks want to keep in touch with you, find you online, get your books, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, do you want to plug anything? Yeah, just you can add me on LinkedIn, Yuri the Artist, or on X at Yuri the Origins. I'm, I'm also very active on X. Most of the things that uh, you're gonna hear about the Center for Cloud Incomes to 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 new releases, I immediately tweak on X. Right? I know that the name is not Twitter anymore, but we always say we tweet. We don't X, we we tweet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's saying you X. That sounds a little bit not safe for work. Yeah. So <laughs> it's going to stay for tweet for a long time. And um, okay. Awesome. Thank you again. Talk to you soon. All right, then. Take care. Thank you.